<laughs> All right, guys, so thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm Sebastian Beswick. I'm currently studying for uh, um, an honours degree at the University of Tasmania. Um, and today I'd like to talk about a topic that's actually very close to my heart um, because it largely underpins one of the things that I love most in the whole world, um, which is music, would you believe? Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> not, not bad haircuts, although I do quite enjoy them. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, computer generated sound. Um, so for my honours project I'm looking at ways that uh, machine learning techniques uh, can actually be used to aid people in producing their own synthesised sounds. Um, and today I'd like to share some of the knowledge that I've gained um, over my last year of study. So what we're going to look at today is we're going to start off by looking at what sound actually is. Uh, we're going to see that sound can be broken down into kind of three core components, um, pitch, amplitude and timbre. Um, and we're going to look at the, the kind of physical representat representation of these properties in the world. <coughs> um, then we're going to look at analog and digital sounds. So how we convert um, a real world sound into something that can be stored and played back inside a computer. Um, we're going to look very briefly at some audio compression techniques, um, uh, kind of how they, how they work. Um, then we're going to look at synthesis techniques. Um, <coughs> so by that I mean how we can actually create a, uh, our own synthesised sound from nothing. Um, and to do that we're going to look briefly at um, Apple Audio units, um, which are a very low level um, kind of powerful API um, that we can use to generate our own sounds. So first things first, um, what is sound? Um, sound is basically just a sequence of waves of pressure that are propagating through a medium, say the air, and we can think of these sounds as just being vibrations, so it's, it's, the, it's the vibrating waves of um, air particles moving that are picked up by, by our ears. And as I said before, there are three key components that are used to physically quantify sounds. Um, the first key component is pitch. Um, now, everyone has a, a very um, in, inherent understanding of what the pitch of a note is and the relative pitches between two notes. Um, so, for example, if I got out my guitar and plucked two different strings, um, we all know that you'd hear two different sounds, you'd hear two different pitches, and it's just an innate human thing that we would be able to say that pitch is higher than that pitch. Um, and we'd be able to tell the difference between the two notes. Um, now the pitch of a note is essentially governed by the frequency of the sound wave um, that's propagating the note. So that's to say um, the speed at which um, the pressure fluctuations um, in the air are occurring. Um, now basically faster vibrations are perceived as higher pitch notes. Um, and a slower vibrations are perceived as lower pitch notes. Um, and in the audio world, we call this the frequency of a sound. Now, frequency is measured in hertz, um, or oscillations per second. And humans, as humans, we can perceive vibrations in the range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. So um, for... Uh, um, for our vibrations that occur from 20 hertz, so 20 times a second to 20,000 times a second, um, our ears pick them up and we perceive them as sound. Um, now, another important thing to note is that music basically operates on a, a logarithmic level. Um, so when you go to the orchestra, and if you haven't been, I would really encourage you to go because it's, really, it's a really great thing. Um, the first thing that the orchestra does is they'll tune um, to the principal oboe player. Um, he'll get out his oboe and he'll play um, his middle A, which vibrates at 440 hertz. And we call that tone an A. Um, now, if he played the next highest A on his instrument, um, it would sound at 880 hertz. So he's gone from his middle A at 440 to his next higher A at 880, uh, which you can see is double the frequency. And similarly, if he plays the next octave up on his instrument, or the next higher A, it's going to play at double that frequency again. <clears throat> so that's what pitch is. Um, the second key component of sound is what's known as amplitude. And going back to our wave description of sound, um, the amplitude is actually the degree of change from high pressure to low pressure. Um, so as you can see on the diagram up there, um, if we represent a, the most simple sort of sound as a sine wave, um, you can see the amplitude is marked in there as uh, basically the change from high pressure to low pressure. <coughs> 
Um, in the real world, we can think of the amplitude as basically being the loudness or the volume of the sound. And basically, this is governed by how much energy was actually put into producing the sound. Um, while I'm on about this, actually, um, when we talk about uh, waves, there are, sounds are actually represented quite literally by waves that look something like that, uh, what we've got up on the screen there. Um, so they oscillate repeatedly from high to low. Um, we'll see a bit later that oscillators are actually quite fundamental components in synthesizers. And um, towards the end of this uh, presentation, we'll look at how we can implement um, a, a really simple um, sine wave oscillator uh, with audio units to produce a nice sine wave. Now, <coughs> so far we've seen two of the important components of a sound or a tone, so it's pitch and it's amplitude. Um, remember the amplitude is basically the loudness of the sound or how much energy it contains, and the pitch is the frequency of the sound. Um, if you imagine all the sounds in the world, there's a whole heap of different sounds, and I can get out my clarinet and play... Um, I actually, would, look, would you believe I didn't bring it? Um, we might have a, a demonstration in maybe 30 seconds, though, um, if we can get some audience participation. Um, but basically, what, so we've defined pitch and amplitude. What else, what else do we need to know about to, uh, to define a sound? So as I said, I can, I, can, um, I can get out my guitar and play the low E string, which will sound at 82 hertz. I didn't actually bring my guitar, but I did bring Nick Winton up here um, with his beautiful bass voice. Um, he could, <laughs> he, so he, he could get up on the stage and he could also sing a low E, which would also sound at uh, 82 hertz. But it's, it's really quite obvious that these sounds, even though he could sing it at the same pitch as my guitar, 82 hertz, and he could sing at the same volume, it's quite obvious that these two sounds are going to sound really different, right? Um, so, what's left over? Um, the, the, difference is a, the difference is a thing called uh, timbre, which is spelt timber, but it's pronounced timbre. And this is one of my favourite definitions of timbre. Um, basically, what this is saying is... Um, sorry, I need to actually read this quote. Um, <laughs> what, what this is actually saying is that for a sound, you've got its pitch, um, you've got its amplitude, and timbre is just everything that's left over. Um, <clears throat> so timbres, it's basically the thing that allows us to quantify the, uh, the difference between two sounds of identical, um, identical pitch and amplitude. And we'll go and, we'll go and have a look at um, the two kind of key components of timbre, um, which are the harmonic content or the spectrum of the sound and the envelope of the sound. Um, we're going to have a look at uh, the spectrum right now and we'll come back to envelopes after we've had a look at our synthesizer example. So, as I said, um, a sound's timbre is basically determined by the, the harmonic content that's present in the signal. Now, what I mean by that is um, <clears throat> if we took not, not a complicated sound like my voice, but a very simple sound like a sine wave, um, we'll hear what a sine wave sounds like in a minute. Um, we know that the sine wave is going to sound well, well, we'll soon see that the sine wave will sound quite different to my guitar and Nick's voice. Um, now, the reason for this comes down to harmonics. So, we've referred to the pitch of a sound as being, um, as being the frequency that it oscillates at. But what I really mean when I say that is the pitch is actually... A, a, a sound is actually composed of a number of frequencies um, that all sound at the same time. So when I say um, Nick could sing a note at 82 hertz, what I mean is that Nick will sing a note um, that actually has a lot of frequencies present, but the lowest one and the, often the loudest one is at 82 hertz. Um, and what our brain actually does is takes in all the information that Nick's singing. Um, it hears the 82 hertz, it hears all the rest of the frequencies, sorry, um, realises that they're actually coming from the same source, and our brain does... It's actually an in incredibly complicated computation to figure out that um, all, these different, all these different frequencies are coming from Nick, so um, we should hear it as the one sound. And I'd like to do a little demonstration to kind of um, 
uh, kind of explain what I really mean here. Oh, if you bear with me for a minute. There we go, perfect. So what we're seeing on the screen at the moment is a program called Audacity, which is a, an open source uh, sound editor. Um, this is really great if you um, get interested by some of the stuff I'm talking about. This is a really great way um, to start playing with stuff very simply. So what I've got here is I've made um, three separate audio tracks. So these are just three separate sounds. And in each of these two bottom tracks, what I've done is just, um, just created two simple sine waves. So I've made this sine wave here at um, 440 hertz, and this sine wave down the bottom here um, I've generated at 880 hertz. So it's exactly double the frequency of the first wave. Um, what we'll see is if I just play this middle sine wave, it's going to sound like this. There we go. Um, so it's going to sound like that. We can say that that's a, it sounds like a very simple tone um, at that 440 hertz frequency. If I go ahead and just play this bottom sine wave by itself, it's going to sound, it's the, going to have the same sort of timbre in the sense that it sounds like a sine wave, but it's, the pitch is going to be twice as um, high. So it's going to sound like it's twice as high as the last note. So there's those two notes playing separately. Oop. There's those two notes playing separately. All right, and what I've done up here in this top track is I've actually quite literally just added these bottom two tracks together. So for every point on each of these sine waves, um, I've just added it together. And it's produced a wave that looks more complicated. Um, but really, all it is is this wave plus this wave. And when we hear that complicated wave, you see that it has a more complicated timbre. It sounds quite different. Um, but interestingly, if I go ahead and play both of those separately, it sounds exactly the same. So even though, um, even though the, the fundamental pitch is still 440 hertz, um, what that extra high frequency component does is um, our, our brain interprets that as kind of being, being a separate aspect of the same sound. And our brain puts it together in our head and says, all right, um, those two waves, when they play together, instead of hearing both of them separately, um, because you're hearing them from the same speaker, um, your brain goes ahead and puts them together and you hear it as a single sound but with a more complicated timbre. So, so there you go, everyone's seen my presenter notes now. Very good. So what we've just seen <coughs> is that even though a sound, we often refer to them as just having a pitch and a volume, it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, now for the more mathematically inclined people in the room, um, the, the Fourier's theorem um, shows us that an oscillating waveform can be transferred from the time domain to the frequency domain. Um, it basically is a sum of simple sine waves. So what, what this actually means um, is that Fourier showed that we can break down any complex sound into um, a sum of very simple sounds. So no matter how complicated a sound we have, we can always break it down into just a number of simple sine waves playing at different amplitudes and different frequencies at the same time. Um, <coughs> so we'll see, um, we'll see how um, the the many uh, synthesis techniques kind of exploit that, um, exploit that fact to generate sounds. Now the next thing I'd look at, like to look at is um, the analog and digital divide. Um, so what we've seen so far is that in the physical world, sound exists as continuous waves. Um, and their, their properties can change infinitesimally. So um, they're analog signals. Um, now I'd like to look at how we can convert these analog signals into something that can be stored within a digital computer. 
So as I said, um, in the real world, pitch and amplitude um, and sounds um, are things that you can change as, as in as, as small a sense as you like uh, to create a different sound. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, we can store sounds um, in an analog sense as continuously changing radio waves, um, continuously changing voltages, or distortions in uh, a physical media like um, an actual vinyl record. Um, and we refer to these representations as analog representations. Now obviously these signals have to be discretized or turned digital before we can store them in a computer. <coughs> and for this, um, the actual wave of sound has to be broken down into a series of discrete steps. Um, so in the real world we have analog signals, we record them um, and store them in, in a computer as a digital signal um, and we call this process transduction. Um, so what we need to do to take um, a real world sound as an analog signal and convert it to a digital signal is use some sort of transducing instrument like uh, a microphone. Um, the way a microphone works is um, <coughs> basically it takes a measurement of the amplitude of whatever sound source it's recording um, at each discrete point in time. So um, basically what happens is very, very quickly the microphone um, takes what we call a sample of sound. Um, so it, it, it does a measurement of how loud the sound is at each point in time and stores that um, by converting it to a voltage, um, which we can then store in a, in a floating point representation inside our computer. Um, now, if, if the microphone takes, its, takes all its measurements at evenly spaced intervals, um, then we can easily re reverse this process um, by sending these signals back into a speaker, um, which is actually just a reverse microphone. So if you cracked open a microphone and had a look at basically the diaphragm, what you would see is basically the same thing as a speaker. Um, and that's why when you plug your headphones into um, your microphone jack by mistake, um, you can still record a little bit of sound. Um, that's basically what the go is there. Um, and once we've completed this, this process and we've stored all our, um, we we've stored our sound as all these discrete floating point values in time, um, we call this file format, well sorry, we call this format um, PCM or pulse code modulation. And this is, this is the most raw um, kind of format that we store audio within a computer. Now, um, <clears throat> to do this recording, we have, to, we have to choose how often a sample of um, the amplitude of the sound is taken by the microphone, and we call this the sampling rate. So up until a point, uh, basically, the higher the sampling rate, i.e. the more measurements that the microphone takes per second, um, the more accurate the digital representation of the sound is, um, but also the more space um, is required to store it. Um, on this diagram here, you'll see that the sampling rate um, is the horizontal increment um, um, on that approximation of the sine wave. Um, basically, the other factor um, governing the, the fidelity of digital audio um, is actually how many discrete steps um, we assign to storing the amplitude at each point in time. So a very soft sound might have an amplitude of 0 0.1, a very loud sound might have an amplitude of 100 million, for example. Um, <coughs> Because we need to store this in a, a floating point number though, um, we need to um, discretize it. Um, so there has to be a minimum, a minimum, um, a minimum step um, for how much the amplitude can differ from each other. And <coughs> we call this the bit depth and it's represented by uh, the horizontal lines on that diagram. So in this diagram, um, I believe the sound, this, this sound has a bit depth of four. So in four bits, we can store 16 different amplitudes. <coughs> now next up, um, we'll have a bit of a quick look at um, some of the different audio formats we use inside computers. Um, audio formats can basically be split up into two broad categories. Um, so we have a lossless category and a lossy category. Um, and as their name suggests, um, lossless formats contain an exact representation of the original recording of the sound. So we're not, we're not um, 
we're not applying any compression at all to the sound. Um, we'll see in a sec that this takes up really quite an unbelievable amount of space. Um, but we, we store this in, uh, in our, our uh, pulse code format um, that we just heard about. <coughs> um, so in uncompressed lossless formats, like our pulse code, our pulse code modulation format, um, silence is stored in the same number of bits um, that sound is stored in. Now this is a very obvious, um, obvious case that we could, uh, it's, it's a very obvious justification for the use of compression because there's some very obvious spots uh, where we could compress sounds to save uh, file size. Um, so for that we have our uh, lossless compression algorithms such as FLAC and ALAC, um, a free version and an Apple version respectively. Um, and they still um, compress audio. What they do is they compress audio to produce um, a compressed version of it, but you don't lose information. Now, obviously, this is ideal in the sense that we get the best quality sound, but it's not ideal in the sense that, um, you know, when we carry our phone or our, our iPod around, uh, we have a very limited amount of space that we can store sound in. So that's the reason we have um, lossy compressed file formats, such as um, MP3s. Um, MP3s do a lot of trickery and witchcraft basically um, to compress sounds and store them in a remarkably smaller amount of space for um, actually not, not, a, not a great reduction in quality. <coughs> so we'll have a, a quick look at a, a concrete example, the um, audio CD format. Uh, just to kind of have a last look at what these terms actually mean before we look at our synthesizer. Um, so CD quality audio is sampled at 44.1 kilohertz, which means um, every second we take um, 44,100 samples of the amplitude, so that's a lot of data, and we store each sample in 16 bits. So, um, and obviously the other thing, when you listen to a CD, um, it's a stereo recording, so you have a left speaker and a right speaker. So um, <coughs> that, that gives us twice the amount of information. So you need, you need that much information for the left speaker and the right speaker. When we um, times them up all together, we get a bit rate of 1.4 megabits a second. And what this means is that in CD quality audio, every second of audio needs 1.4 megabits to store it. And that's a lot. That's really a lot. Um, now, most online music streaming services such as Spotify and Mog um, will default to streaming their, um, their music at a bit rate of 128 kilobits per second um, as compressed MP3s, um, which is obviously quite a, a significant downgrade compared to CD quality audio. Um, however, MP3 compression really is quite good. Um, in fact, most people, if not really almost all people, can't tell the difference between um, a 320 kilobyte a second MP3 and CD quality audio. Um, a lot of people will tell you that they can, but <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Um, in, in my opinion, um, it's, it's the quality of the gear you use to listen to your music that has the biggest, the biggest impact. Um, on your sound quality, once you get past a raw bit rate of say um, 120, uh, sorry, 160 kilobits per second, um, it, I, I, I really believe it comes much more down to the quality of your equipment. And obviously when you're listening to a sound, ev every, every link in the chain is important. So if you start off with a bad sound, no matter how expensive your headphones are, it's still gonna be a bad sound. But in my opinion, it's, uh, Really, I think headphones are one of the most um, important links in that chain. Once you've got past um, that raw bitrate barrier, um, the next thing I would say is if you want better quality sound, um, invest in a better set of headphones. Um, so basically really not, um, not, not earbud headphones. Um, oh, all right, while I'm here, as, as another aside, um, <laughs> it's very widely claimed that the original prototype for the audio CD, which was developed by Philips and Sony, 
um, was only proposed to be capable of storing 60 minutes worth of audio. Um, but it turned out that the president of Philips at the time, or the CEO, um, turned out that his favourite piece of music was Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which goes for, uh, I think a recording goes for 75 to 80 minutes. Um, <coughs> and what actually happened was that CD format was actually increased, um, or so the story goes, it was increased um, to 80 minutes or 700 meg, um, so that a full recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony could fit in a single disc. Um, for anyone that doesn't get this joke, Beethoven also, um, <laughs> Beethoven actually went de deaf quite early in his life, so when he wrote his Ninth Symphony, he was completely deaf, he never heard it. Um, isn't that nuts? Like, <laughs> oh, I think that's crazy, I think it's great, he was a genius. Right, so that was that. <coughs> the next thing we're going to look at is, um, we're going to have a quick look at a couple of synthesis techniques. And by sound synthesis, um, I'm going to put out a definition that says sound, sy sound synthesis is the process of producing an audio signal by means of applying an algorithm or performing a series of computations as opposed to a simple reproduction of a sound. So basically sound synthesis is either the act of generating a sound or some samples that make up a sound um, either from nothing or uh, taking a sound that already exists and altering those samples in an algorithmic manner to come up with a new sound. Um, and sound synthesis can really be um, as, as simple as just applying equalization to a sound. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be creating a new sound from scratch. It can be taking a sound, applying some equalization to make it sound better and getting a, 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 you know, a new sound out at the end. Um, so before we look at how we would actually implement a synthesizer um, a, in a specific implementation. Um, I'll touch quite briefly on four very common sound synthesis techniques, um, starting with um, additive synthesis. Now, we heard before that um, <coughs> Fourier's theorem shows us that we can break down any complicated sound into um, basically a sum of some very simple sounds. And this is exactly how um, additive synthesis works. Um, in additive synthesis, we take a whole heap of simple sine waves, plus them all together, um, and get a complicated wave out at the end. Um, and in theory, any sound can be recreated exactly um, if, you, if you sum up the right, um, the right component sound waves, so the, the sine waves that have the correct amplitude um, and frequency um, in the correct order. Um, <coughs> the next synthesis technique is called subtractive synthesis and it's basically the opposite of additive synthesis. So in additive synthesis we start with nothing and add in simple sine waves until we get something. With subtractive synthesis we start off with something complicated, so uh, a quite complicated waveform and we take things away from it until we end up with something. Um, <coughs> so as opposed to a sine wave, um, there's other waves that you might like to look up later called square waves and triangle waves um, that when you graph them they do look like squares and triangles. Um, and that's because they have, um, instead of just the single frequency that we have in a sine wave, they have a lot of different frequencies um, together. So by taking away some of those frequencies um, we can create new sounds in that way as well. Um, the next one is frequency modulation synthesis. Um, it's an extremely powerful technique. Um, <coughs> so we had additive synthesis where the sine waves were added together, subtractive synthesis where um, some sort of waves were, um, or frequencies were removed from the original signal. Um, and in both of those techniques, we require um, a very large number of waves. Um, so to generate a, an interesting sound via additive synthesis, you need to add up a really large number of sine waves. Um, the way frequency modulation works um, is instead of adding the waves together or subtracting them, what you do is you compose them together in a functional sense. Um, so the output of one of the waves is used as the input um, of the other. So it's taking the sine of a sine. Um, and frequency modulation synthesis is extremely powerful in two senses. Um, number one, it allows you to create uh, extremely complicated sounds that change over time in a periodic manner. 
um, because you have that functional um, composition of periodic functions happening. Um, and the other thing that's really great about um, frequency modulating synthesis is that you only need to do calculations over two sine waves. So instead of additive synthesis, where you need uh, really hundreds of sine waves um, to produce something that sounds very interesting, with frequency modulating synthesis, um, you can take two sine waves and modulate them together and come up with something that's really interesting um, while doing a very minimal number of calculations. So it's very, it's computationally, it's, um, it's very efficient. Um, the last form of synthesis we'll look at is called sampling synthesis. And it's not strictly really a synthesis method in the sense that um, it's not an algorithmic process, but it's one of the most, pro probably the most familiar um, synthesis method to, um, you know, everyone really. Um, and what, how sampling synthesis works is you hear it all the time in um, electronic music, pop music. Um, a sampling synthesizer stores a copy of a sound and it plays it back on demand. So that, that's, really, um, that's really all it is. And <coughs> sampling synthesis lets you, um, you know, take a large number of sounds, um, which we call samples, but really we're talking about a different thing um, to the samples that we talked about earlier. Um, what we're talking about with these sorts of samples is, um, you know, a, a snippet of audio that's already been recorded. Um, but sampling synthesis, we don't see it as being particularly powerful because um, you can't really create new things very easily with it. It's quite hard to create new things. Um, but it's a, it's a very, um, very popular form of you know, sound synthesis. <coughs> so the last thing we have to look at today is um, Apple Audio units. Um, these work in, so they're an iOS and um, an OS X uh, API. Um, and they're basically software plugins um, that we can use to process um, and synthesize audio data. Um, so we can use them to create new sounds or uh, manipulate existing sounds that are stored in post, uh, pulse code modulating format, um, which is the format of the, the raw samples that we saw earlier. Um, as you can see in the diagram, in iOS, they exist at the lowest level of the audio stack, basically before you hit drivers and hardware. So they're very low level, they're very powerful, um, but that makes them extremely difficult to use. Um, so you should really only be using them if you need a, a very, high, um, very high degree of control um, over your stream of audio, um, or if you need a, a, spe a specific feature that's um, offered by them, such as equalization or echo cancellation. <coughs> so we generally use um, audio units when a very low latency um, audio I.O. is required. Um, so say you were implementing a, a voice chat client, um, you're going to want low latency, so um, direct access to um, that sound data is best if, you're, um, if you want input and output to happen at the same time. Um, the next time that, sorry, the next case in which they're um, a very useful thing to use is if you're implementing a custom synthesizer, um, which can be used to great effect in uh, applications such as games to create custom sound uh, dynamically based on, um, say, how a player moves or what happens in the game world. Um, and this is especially interesting because one of the powerful features of audio units is that they can be connected up in, uh, in a sort of graph structure. So what I mean by that is that the output of one audio unit can be used um, as an input to another audio unit. So we can chain them together like that. Um, <coughs> as an example, um, if you're writing, say, a karaoke app, um, you could have one audio unit that grabs a signal from the mic and sends it straight through to the speaker, um, and another audio unit that um, takes the signal from the mic and adds a reverb effect. All right? So, while the host was speaking to the karaoke group, um, you wouldn't want to add any reverb to the voice. Um, you just want it to go straight through the system. Um, but when the singer started singing, um, you'd want to add in that reverb so their voice sounded a bit nicer um, while they were singing. And with, with audio units, it's reasonably easy um, to do that and just slip extra units into the chain. <coughs> 
<coughs> so basically, there's four steps involved in creating a synthesized sound, um, which we've covered now. So this should hopefully make a lot of sense. Um, basically, um, the four steps are the first thing we have to do is create a buffer to store our sound in. Um, and then we have to fill it with a whole heap of samples. So um, those, those PCM samples that we talked about earlier, um, we fill the buffer with a lot of them. Um, <coughs> and then basically the samples just get played back um, as audio. Now we'll have a look at some code examples. Um, kind of the important thing to remember is um, these units are low level. Um, so there's a lot of boilerplate code um, involved in using them. Um, when I was uh, doing extra research for this talk, um, I uh, went on the internet and found a great, um, a great tutorial by a guy called um, Matt Gallagher, who I actually just found out yesterday, um, spoke at this conference a couple of years ago. Does anyone know Matt? Yeah, cool. So. What a champ. Um, and um, I'll include a link. So he, he runs a blog called um, From Coco With Love. Um, you can find that via Google. And he has a really great um, and a really quite detailed um, introduction to um, audio units, which um, you know, contains all this boilerplate code. We'll just look at, um, we'll just look at the basics of it. So the first thing we need to do is create an audio component instance. So we can open um, an audio unit. We're calling it here tone unit. And then we need to initialize it and start it playing sound. Um, what happens when it starts playing sound is <coughs> um, a, a callback function has to be registered. And basically, um, every time our buffer of sound uh, which the operating system plays for us, runs out of samples. Um, this callback structure, um, so this, this callback uh, function gets called um, and uh, the onus is then on us to fill up the buffer again so the sound can continue playing. Um, this is the method header for um, <coughs> that callback function. Um, it's called quite regularly um, to refill the buffer. Um, these arguments here, um, the most important ones, are that, so that first argument is um, the audio unit that we're creating sound for. The next two is um, more boilerplate-ish, um, a set of flags um, to determine you know, some stuff about the sound. Um, and the audio timestamp, um, in timestamp, which is um, the, the time that the sound will play um, on the computer. Um, the next one is the output bus number, which we don't need to worry about for the moment. Um, <coughs> that second last argument, um, the int um, in number frames, is the amount of frames of audio that need to be uh, generated to fill up the buffer. So by this, I mean the amount of samples that need to be stored in the buffer. So remember, we represent sound as a sequence of samples. Um, that number tells us how many we need to generate and dump in the buffer. <coughs> and that last argument there is um, actually the buffer, or a, a list of buffers. So if, if you remember, in, um, in stereo sound, uh, we have two speakers. Theoretically, we can have as many as we like. Um, DVD audio has five or six. Um, in our very simple case, though, we'll just be generating a, a mono sound. Um, and so we'll only be using the first buffer in this list. So here are a few uh, variables that we just have to define. Um, amplitude and frequency should make sense. So we're, we're um, making a sine wave um, with an amplitude of 0 0.5, frequency of 440 hertz, a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz, which is pretty standard. Um, and the next thing we have to find there is a variable called uh, theta increment, which is basically what we're doing is, um, like we saw before, we take the samples off the sine wave by taking a measurement of the sine wave at each point in time. Um, so this, this theta increment is really a, a convenience variable um, that allows us to um, move the sine wave basically to the next point in time. So I think that's really the easiest way to think of it. Um, 
this theta, theta is used as an argument into the sine wave to say, um, you can think of it as being which point is the sine wave we're up to. And we're just incrementing it so that um, for each sample, um, we go ahead to the next point in the sine wave appropriately. Um, and this is the real, this bit of code here is the real crux of our synthesizer. That first line of code is just um, initialising a, a, a buffer, so an array of floats um, <coughs> that we can store our, our sound data in. Um, the, what the for loop there is doing is um, for each, for each um, sample that we need to generate, um, it's just looping through that, that number of samples. So, um, so we need to generate 50 samples, that loop's going to run 50 times, um, so one for each sample. And all we're doing in that, in that, um, in that loop, so that next line there, I uh, don't know if I've got a pointer, um, <coughs> that buffer frame equals sine theta times amplitude, all we're doing is taking a measurement of the sine wave at that point in time. Um, and that's, that's um, just, that's, so that, that measurement of the amplitude of the sine wave is exactly kind of what we've been talking about for this whole talk uh, when we say that, um, you know, when we say that um, a sound is just a series of amplitudes, um, you know, played back very quickly one after another. Um, those last few lines are just um, incrementing theta um, so that we can move along the sine wave. Um, cleaning up afterwards is quite easy. Um, you just call those methods. Um, <clears throat> so as I said before, um, there's a great example project that goes into a lot of detail on how that synthesizer example works um, by Matt Gallagher. Um, you can access it there. If you're interested in this sort of stuff, then definitely have a crack at, um, at downloading this example, download Audacity, um, have a play with some sine waves. Um, you can generate a lot more complicated tones in Audacity as well. You can apply effects. Um, it's a really fun thing to play around with and it's really easy to get into. So, um, <clears throat> just briefly, what we looked at today is what a sound actually is. So, we saw that a sound was made up of pitch, amplitude and timbre. Um, then we looked at analog sounds and digital sounds, so how we store sounds in the real world and how we can represent them inside a computer. Um, <clears throat> then we had a quick look at some audio file formats and compression. Um, run through the four kind of really major synthesis techniques, so that was additive synthesis, subtractive synthesis, um, frequency modulating synthesis, and uh, sampling synthesis. Um, we didn't have time to look at ADSR envelopes today, unfortunately, but um, if anyone's interested in this stuff, then please um, feel free to come and grab me at some point um, and have a chat about it. I love talking about audio stuff, so um, that'd be really great. And then we had a look at the um, Apple Audio Unit example. Um, so that's it for me. Thanks so much, guys, um, for coming to hear me. I hope everyone got something out of it. Um, uh, to wrap up, I'd like to say thanks to, um, thanks to the a AUC, AJ and Tony, um, for inviting me to come up to speak. And especially a big thanks for um, providing me with a, a scholarship to go to um, WWDC this year, which is really great. And it's a real shame that um, it's probably not in the cards to happen again. But cheers, guys. Thanks so much. So um, if anyone has any questions, I'll take, um, take some questions. What happens when your buffer runs out? Is there a callback to fill it up again or anything? Yes. Okay. Um, so... Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Um, so the, the question was, um, what happens when your buffer runs out of audio? Um, is there some sort of callback to... Um, to uh, ask the, to kind of ask you to fill up the buffer again. Um, yes, there is, um, and it's that. Um, it's this audio unit render function here that um, you register as a callback, um, and that that gets called repeatedly um, when the information in the um, in the buffer gets low, and that's it's an operating system thing um, that you don't have to worry about. You you only need to know that. Um, when the operating system needs some more sound, um, it'll ask you for it and it'll tell you how much it wants.
separate audio unit sort of for each of your sam uh, for each of your sort of input uh, wave, or would you uh, just have the computation for filling up the buffer actually uh, do, the, do the addition of the, the waves there? So. Um, that, that question was, um, if you wanted to implement a, uh, an additive synthesizer, um, <coughs> would you create a, a new audio unit to um, represent each of those sine waves, or, or uh, um, so the, the question was, would you create a new audio unit for each of the sine waves, or would you... Yeah, so there's, there's, um, there's two ways you can do that. I, either of those ways are appropriate. Um, you, could, you could generate um, a large number of audio units and chain them together in a, an AU graph. Um, but obviously that's going to be computationally, there's going to be a lot more overhead involved in that. Um, so that's, that's not the way I do it. The way I would do it is um, um, inside your render callback function. Um, <coughs> I think it would make much more sense to define a series of sine waves in there um, and sum them together in there um, just in the one audio unit. <coughs> Time for probably one more question. Because when, when, when you're recording some of the most voice interface, um, I've been told that lower, like, lower end, like, if they define themselves to be able to do that. But between which um, frequencies should you record um, voice? Ah. Um, at, at, at what frequency should you record a voice? No, I'd say, I'd say, so, sorry, the question was, um, when you're recording a voice, um, basically what, what frequencies are the most interesting, um, uh, to record? Um, it kind of depends. Um, so, you're saying that um, someone suggested that you chop off um, the lower frequencies in the voice. Um, there's, I mean, there's certainly, there's, there's that aspect. Um, voice, I mean, you know, you can chop off the really low stuff. Um, so 100 hertz down um, is not going to play too much into it, probably. Um, you can chop off the really high stuff, um, so 10 kilohertz up. Um, but it all, it all really depends on, on the quality of your microphone. So in a, in a general sound engineering sense, um, you, you would definitely not chop anything out because it's the high end stuff that makes it sound good. And like on, on a telephone, um, so if you imagine talking on a telephone, um, that actually does, um, <laughs> that, that, that actually does only, it, it reduces the number of frequencies present um, um, to save bandwidth basically and you can hear that it, it sounds bad so really you can't take very much out um, but when you're recording from an iPhone microphone um, the microphone quality isn't going to be particularly high also if you're playing it back out of an iPhone speaker the speaker quality isn't high either so if, if you chop off your highs and your lows you're probably not going to notice um, because it's probably going to sound bad anyway because you've recorded it from a bad source and <laughs> Sorry, if, if, you're, if you're on your Android phone um, <laughs> and you know, you'd, you'd record it from that microphone, you're playing it back from that speaker, um, you've recorded and you're playing it back from a bad source, so if you, you know, perform some trickery um, to save some space, then yeah, that's appropriate. But it all really just depends on, um, really just depends on um, how important the quality of the sound is to you. So obviously it's, it's more important for a karaoke app than it is for um, a Skype sort of app. All right, thanks guys. Thanks so much. Have a great conference. <laughs>